Hey everybody, Lars here. Uh, tonight we are going to catch up on all of those little things that have to do with object orientation that we haven't gone over. So far we've gone over the big things. On video one, we went over what object orientation is all about. We took a look at classes, how we make the blueprints that allow us to create our objects. Uh, in the second video, we went over inheritance, how we can take a class and use it as a base and just add to it by inheriting other classes. We also learned about polymorphism, uh, many forms where two methods can have the same name in different classes, but do different things based on their context or what they are. In our instance, we had animals and we had our cat say meow and our animal just said sound. But as you know, I alluded to a little bit last video, our animal class is more like what we would call an abstract class or a base class. So we really don't want to instantiate it because there's no such thing as a generic animal. Every animal is either a dog, a cat, a human, or whatever. And we would just use something like that as a base class. But it's handy, and it's going to come in handy tonight, as you'll see. Um, tonight, we're going to go catch some other little nicky knack things that we can do with object orientation and it's fun and it's interesting and it's the kind of stuff that you would do if you were out there in the real world being a programmer so let's get started I grabbed the code that we had used I was gonna say yesterday but in our last video uh, where we just did the animal class and as you can see the animal class is there and we did cat and then we ran some code we're not gonna need the code anymore so let's just zoink that. And real fast, and I'm going to show you how easy this is. I'm going to take that cat class. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to come down here. And I'm going to paste it. So now there's two cats. And I'm going to make a dog. So we have something different. Now, it's funny. You look at everything. It's not class specific. Okay? The only thing I'm really going to do is I'm going to go down here to my speak method. I'm going to make him say woof. But after that, you know what? Control S, save, boom. That's simple. We now have a dog. So when you have a well-defined base or abstract class, uh, it's very easy to create new animals. You just give them a little bit of new functionality, and boom, you go. And as you can see, our cat class easily became a dog class. If we kept it the same as cat, you know, we just added color and made the speak say woof. So now we have a dog. So now, let's say D1. is a dog we will call him Fido we will make him 35 pounds and we will make him brown okay and then when we create Fido we will print a bunch of things about Fido let's say Fido d1 dot get name uh, after that we'll do DQ we go for a Sunday d1 there we go. D1 get name. D1 get weight. And we'll leave the color out. Okay? So let's do a second dog. And we'll say dog uh, Rex. And we'll make Rex a smaller dog, 15 pounds. And we'll make Rex an Irish setter. We'll make Rex red. And then. Let me just go grab this. I'll come down here. And I'll just make these D2s. Okay. And then one last thing I'm going to do is I'll create a cat. Let's go revive Felix. And we'll make Felix one pound. And if memory serves, Felix was orange. Hey, now we have Felix back. And then we can just print C1 and C2. And then C1. Okay. All right, let's see if I save this and run it, what we get. All right, great. We got our animals, our animures. So we see after we run, we've got Fido, 35 pounds, correct. Rex, 15, Felix, 12. All right, we're in good shape, okay? Now, 
for the sense of for the sake of argument, let's say I want to always count how many animals I have at a certain time. Uh, when I look at D1 and then I create D2, D2 doesn't know anything about D1. D2 says go use dog class as a blueprint and dog uses animal and create an object that's a dog but it has nothing to do with the first dog. Okay, None of these animals really know about each other or can you know share variables and if you think to yourself, well, maybe you could set up a counter and click it every time that you create an object. That would actually work, but there's a more sophisticated way to do it. And the way we do it is with the first of the different things we're going to look at tonight, and that's called class variables. And what we do with class variables is very simple. When you have your class, you create variables, usually in the constructor, that are only used for that particular object that's created. When I create D1, and it's a dog, Fido, 35, and Brown is only used for that object. So when I come up here and I say Fido and whatever, and I create the object that goes down to dog to have the color added to it, that's only for that object, okay? That's not for everything that uses animal. But if we want we can get away from these variables. These variables are called instance variables. They're only for the particular instance when animal is used as a blueprint to create an object. But we can use another kind of variable, and it's called a class variable. And where we define it is here, outside of any of the methods out by its own. And the way we declare it, we don't really declare it, we just create it and set it equal to zero or any other initial variable that you'd like to start with. And I usually call it a count for animal count. And we're going to use it to count how many animals we have. Now, think to yourself, if I want to keep track of animals, when do I want to click that counter and say that I have an animal? A good place to do it is in the constructor for animal. So what we do is we add a line to the constructor. And what we do is we say a count plus equals one. And I make that variable increment by one every time we create an animal. Now, I can tell you right now that if I were to run this, it would explode. And I'm gonna prove it to you by running it. And it explodes. And the reason it explodes is because when we use class variables, we have to be very specific and tell Python, hey, this is a class variable and it resides in a class. Okay, we have a count here. And you would think to yourself, my God, five lines before I just, you know, defined it, it should be fine. But this thinks we're dealing with instance variables. This thinks we're dealing with, with things that have to do with the object that's being created. So it sees self and name and weight and that's it. Okay, it doesn't know what a count is. There's not a self in front of it. So it doesn't know to create an instance variable. So we need to tell it. And the way we tell it is by putting the class name in front of it. So yes, idle, how wonderful. So we put the class name in front. Now we're always going to know the class name because we have that defined. So now the program's going to know, oh, okay, I've got a class variable that I'm using. So I reference it by saying animal.a count. So now if we were to run it, everything's fine again. Now we don't use it yet, but we're going to use it in a second, so you're going to see what the deal is. Now, there's one last thing we want to do. Just like our other variables, we want to have getters and setters. Now, sometimes class variables have setters, but most of the time we use internal logic to change their variables, to change their values, I mean to say. So what we really want to do is just create a getter for it. So I go to the bottom of my getters and setters. And I just say def uh, get a count, I say self, and I return, retron, boy, I wish that changed to that. And I just return animal, always tell it where it is, dot a count, and that's it, okay? So outside now, and I'm going to show you in a second, I can use that to... Tell me how many animals I have at any given time. And let's go do that. Uh, down here, I have dog, Fido, get name, get weight. I will print a new line. And I will say 
animal count. And I will reference D1 dot get a count. Not wood. And if we run this, now under Fido, when I create Fido, it says animal count is one. Let's go add that. To the rest of the animals and see what we get now. There we go. Look at that. So now we have Fido, Animal 1, Animal 2, Animal 3. We're in pretty good shape. Now, if you're clever, you've noticed something, is that I never changed the variables, but it still works. Because that variable is getting changed, and all I'm doing is accessing it through one variable. That's fine. If I wanted to, I could change these, and I could access it through any variable I wanted. If I rerun this, you'll see that Yes, I will say it. That it oh, maybe a lot left. Do I have a typo? Yes, I do. Because I know it should run fine, and it does. Okay? So now I'm using the individual variables. But it's a class variable. It's going to be the same for all of the classes because it's a main thing. Here's the, the dirty little behind-the-scenes secret. Um, the man behind the curtain is really when I create an object with a class, what Python secretly does is creates a super object off to the side. That's an object for managing this class. And that's where that variable resides. So it's only one variable, and it's only in one spot in that particular class object. But when I change it and I access it, I can access it via the instance objects or, truth be told, I can access it another way, but that's for another time. That's for another time and place. So I can access this through D1 through D1, D2, D2, C1, C1, or I can use the same one. It's probably a good idea to make sure you're accessing it through something that you know is going to be there, because as you're going to see in a second, we can also delete objects. And if you delete an object and you attempt to access a class variable using that deleted object, you will get an error. So be weary of that. But we now have a class variable, which is keeping track of our animals. We, in, we increment it in the constructor. And we have a, a getter for it right here in the animal class. And we can use it now to keep track of how many animals we have. But what we've done over here begs a question. How would we get rid of an animal? Okay. Um, back in the olden days, <coughs> memory was very scarce, okay? When your computer had memory, it didn't have a whole lot of it. So a lot of time and effort was put into being efficient with our memory when we wrote programs. When object orientation came around in the 80s, you would have your constructor, which when you created an object would create your variables, allocate your memory, and give you back an object waiting to be used with the different methods that are prescribed in the class. But then when you were done with that object, you didn't just throw it out into space and not use it anymore. It was taking up memory, and if you knew you weren't using it anymore, you wanted to reclaim that memory. And the way you would reclaim that memory is by getting rid of that object or destroying that object and sending the memory back to that all-purpose memory area us, programs have, us programmers call the heap. And we would want to get rid of the object and, and give the memory back to the heap. Now, nowadays, we're lousy with memory. We have a lot of memory, and it's very cheap. And if you know anything about the garbage collection model of Java, it's not taken very seriously. And a lot of people will just leave their objects laying out there. I have seen Python courses and other language courses that do not even talk about what we're about to talk about. And that is the opposite of the constructor, a method called the deconstructor. Okay, it has nothing to do with the Rita or the, or the nuts in the 60s. The deconstructor is the method that we want to run when we destroy our object. Whereas the constructor is what we run when we create it, the deconstructor is what we run when we destroy it. So, a couple things I'm going to have to teach you here. Number one, how do you destroy an object? Well, it's very simple. In our little instance right here, 
we are going to, I think we're going to destroy Felix. <laughs> we're going to make it a dog party. So I'm going to type the Python command. And if you go look at your keywords, you'll see it. And you're going to see beautiful little idle, turn it orange, D-E-L, obviously for delete. Okay. And then all you have to do after that is boom, put in the name of your variable that's, that's pointing towards the object. And that will delete that object and take any memory that it's using and send it back to the heap so that it can be used. Now, if I ran this program, we'd still probably be okay because as you will find out later, there is a big overarching God class called the super class. And it's got all of these abstract different things written for us already, like init and like Dell and like some other things we're going to see soon. So to be honest, you can create a class and not even have a constructor because there's an overarching constructor that you can be used. All classes that you create, when I created the animal class, it inherited from an all-purpose class that Python uses. This is getting in the weeds. You don't have to know all of this stuff. But when it pops in my head, I want to tell you about it because you're going to be Python programmers. I want you to you know, know all the facts and know all the basics and know all the behind the scenes. So there is a Dell out there that this would use, but I don't want to use that Dell. I want to write my own. So what do I do? I'm going to do it in the animal class because this is my base class and everything's using it. And what I usually do is I make sure as my constructor is the first method that I have in my method list. I always want to make my deconstructor the last thing. So what is it? Dunder, Dell, Dunder. That's it. Okay. And now in this method, I can create a list of instructions and things to do before I destroy an object and send its memory back to the heap and we can reference it no longer and it doesn't exist any longer. The first thing I'm going to do here is I'm just going to print uh, self dot name comma has been destroyed. Sorry, Felix. Nothing personal. We'll go create you again soon. So that way when I run the Dell, it'll print Felix has been destroyed. And then what do I want to do? I have one less animal. So I want to say animal dot a count is less one animal. So now when I run Dell, what's going to happen? Dell C1. What is C1? C1 is a variable holding an object that was built with cat. Let me go to cat. Cat. Does cat have a dunder Dell? No, 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 no. Did cat inherit from something? Yes, it did. Animal. Let's go up and look at animal. Does animal have a dunder del? Yes, it does. Dunder del dunder self. So what am I going to print? Self dot name. And this object, it's Felix. So it'll print Felix has been destroyed and it will decrement the animal counter. So where, as you can see over here, it was once three. It will now be two. And we will show that by deleting that. And then... We will print the animal counter, but what do we what did we have here? We have a problem. We just deleted C1, and then we're going to use it as a reference. Uh -uh. Don't do that. I'll use another one. Truth be told, I don't have to. I can just use animal. We'll test that in a second. Um, so there we go. So now let's run this and figure out if we did anything wrong. And we didn't. Fido, animal 1. Rex, animal 2. Felix, animal 3. But then Felix had to go bye-bye. So Felix has been destroyed. You'll see. Del C1 triggered the running of the Dunder DL in the animal class. So Felix has been destroyed. I decremented my animal count. I accessed it through you know, Fido. But now the animal count is two. So now when I destroy an animal, my animal count is kept up to date. Now we are going to show you that even from the outside um i can access this do oh no i don't want to do that you know what i want to do i don't want to run this is inside baseball i'm not running a method here i'm actually grabbing the variable itself okay and i believe i have access to that 
variable as long as I tell Python that it's that because Python, all the Python class stuff defaults as public. We will not get into public, private, protected, and all of the different modes and encapsulation stuff. I, I, I skip over that. If you've taken a C++ or a Java course and you're used to learning about encapsulization and hiding things and private versus public and blah, 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 I don't bother with that. I do everything public. You can learn about that later. I always think that inheritance, polymorphism, and these kind of things are a lot more important than all of that stuff. So let's see if I'm right or if I'm wrong. I could be wrong, but I'm not. Animal count will give us two. So I can directly access that variable by telling Python what class to go look at and give me that class variable from there. Okay, so that's actually probably a better way to access that variable because who knows what's going to get deleted and when it's going to get deleted. I went right to the source there. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So we've seen how easy it is to just take the cat and make a dog and create a whole bunch of different animals using the animal class as our base. Then we went on to look at class variables and how we can have a variable that all instances and objects that are created with that class can have access to it. It's like a home base where they can keep variables and exchange messages. You'll learn that that's an important uh, part of class variables later. That objects can talk to each other via class variables and do different things along those lines. Then after that, we learned about deconstructors and how where the constructor is the method that's run when we create an object, the deconstructor is the method that's run when we destroy an object. And we can, you know, maintain counters with our class variables and use the deconstructor as the time where we would decrement a counter or do some other things. As you could probably imagine in gaming, there's a lot of things. I mean, if you kill a bad guy and then the bad guy goes away, you know what? The bad guy's an object. And if I kill the bad guy... Well, then that's a really good place for me to go to the scoreboard and give myself points for killing that bad guy. So a lot of times you know, when I do gaming stuff, if there's a bad guy object and I have a deconstructor for that bad guy and that bad guy in his deconstructor goes and gives points to a big scoreboard if, if it's a bad guy going away. So there's a lot of different places where you could use deconstructor stuff. Okay, We're going to do two more things before we get out of here. Um, the first one is pretty neat. I've always liked this. I'm going to leave this the way it is, and I am just going to print D1. Think about that. In the past, when you printed an integer, you've just printed the variable, boop, and it prints out 7, 8, 22, negative 23. Same with a float. Same with a string. Print your string. It'll print the whole line or print the name or print whatever that string is. What happens if I just tell the Python print function to print my object? I created it myself. It's not, nothing Python did or had or waiting. It's an object I created myself. Okay? Dog. It's the dog object, which I created. It inherited from animal, which I created. What happens when I try to print that? Let's take a look. All right. See that last crazy line down there? Dunder main dunder dot dog object. It says it's a dog object. That's pretty good. At whatever. Look at that craziness. That, my friends, is a memory location. Okay? Because if you think about it, D1 was created by me. Python doesn't know what it is. It's not a primitive data type like an integer or a floating point or a string or anything like that. Python has no idea what to do with it. Python doesn't even, it, it, kind of, it knows what it's been labeled, but it doesn't know what it does or how it does it. So Python does the only real thing it can. It spits out its memory location. It's like Python is saying, I don't know what the hell I am, but I know where I am, so I'll tell you where I am, and it spits out a memory location, okay? If we want to print real useful information when we print objects, we have to tell, as the programmers, we have to tell Python what to print, okay? But there's an easy way to do it, and that's going to be the next thing we do up here in our animal class. What we are going to do, and basically what we've done with Dell and what we've done with init, is we're going to override the base functionality of a method. There is already an init that animal inherited from the superclass. We overrode it because we want to use our own. The same with dunder, Dell, dunder. We overrode it. We want our own. 
we, like we discussed with polymorphism, are overriding the functions that we inherit when we have our own specific functionality that we want to perform. I'm not going to do it at the end because I want my deconstructor to be at the end, but right before the end, I am going to write a new method. Dunder, str for string, dunder. Okay? This method is what gets called when you use the print function. Now, dirty little behind the scenes secret. When you create an integer, there's an integer class that's being called. Everything you've been using up to now is really a class. Now, if you do type on it, it'll come back and say int. And if you do type on list, it comes back and says class list. But you know what? There's an integer class. There's a float class. There's a bunch of different classes, and Python is, are, is using that. So that those classes have str methods. Those str methods say, all right, well, this variable is defining an integer called 7. Just print 7 to the screen. This string has Lars's goofy name, L-A-R-S. Just print L-A-R-S to the screen. Well, now, with our object, we have to tell the print function what we want to display when we print our objects. Now, what I usually do, sometimes I just do the name, but I think I'm going to do everything for this. The string function returns a string. So what you want to do is you want to build a string. So what I usually do is I will do a string whatever self dot name. Then I will concatenate plus, actually I should go plus space plus self dot weight plus space plus and that's all that animal has so that's all I'm going to print because I don't want to play games. So self dot name and self dot weight. It, usually it's helpful later on when you program in a more professional capacity is to overwrite your string method and you'll say they, they, there's something very similar in Java that you use. And I would always just make it a data dump so that whatever the instance variables were for that particular object, my dunder string just dumps it. So that's what I do here. If I wanted to do every single thing, I would go to the top and I would do a dunder string dunder for dog so that I would print color and then I would print all the other stuff. But I'm doing it in my base class, so I'm just going to do the variables I have access to, which is fine. And then at the end, I return a string. That string is what's going to be printed when I print D1. Okay? Let's make sure everything is good. I'm just going to say, All right. That looks good to me. Let's run it and find out. Save. Uh, tension's killing me. Oh, it blew up. Why did it blow up? Uh, there's a, there's a, I can't convert an object to string. Oh, da, 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 da. You'd think the professor would know that we're dealing with strings when we concatenate. And we need to make sure everything is a string and not an integer. There we go. Beautiful. Oof, we didn't even print it. Oh, yeah, we did. FIDO35. There we go. I should really let it know that it's coming from string. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, and we'll just put str like that so we know it's from the string method. Now when I rerun it, boom, it works. String FIDO35. Look at that. So now... In the main program where I say print D1, what happens? D1, what is that? D1 is a variable holding an object that was created with dog. I go to dog. I want to print something. Is there a dunder string? No, but I inherited from animal. Okay, let me go up to animal. Is there a dunder string? Yes, there is. So what am I doing? I'm going to create a string. It's going to start with that. Then it's going to have the name, in this case, Fido. Then it's going to give me a space, and then it's going to give me the weight. I'm going to put all that together in one string, and then I'm going to return that string. And that is what I'm going to print when I do my print statement. And that is what you see down there. So you can print whatever you want when you print these things. So now we have a pretty decent little class set up here. We have a base class animal. 
with its constructors, getters or setters for name and weight. We can make it speak. So, you know, this is a bass class, so sound doesn't impress us much. But the cat says meow, the dog says wolf. We now can print them out and find out the names and the weights of them. And when we destroy them, they decrement our counter. We now keep a counter to know how many animals we have. So at any given time, I could just say print animal.a count and find out exactly how many animals I have. I have only two right now. I think I only got Fido and Rex. Okay? So that's how we deal with overriding. When we... Later, if you explore programming more, you're going to learn about something called overloading, where you can have in one class uh, the same method name for a bunch of different things, and the only thing that's different is the argument list. A name plus its argument list is usually called the signature of the function or the method, and you can have differing signatures all do different things. Python doesn't really support that. But the way it gets around that is by overriding. They will tell you just create, you know, just create a subclass and override the functionality that you want to override with a different parameter list. It's it's we, it's different. Sometimes overloading gets to be a bit much. So there's also another thing that we are completely skipping over called multiple inheritance that C++ uses where you can inherit from multiple classes and not just one, believe me, that is Pandora's box. And even when I was a young, bushy-tailed programmer that thought I knew everything in the world, I multiple inheritance was a real pain in the butt. And we are also not going to talk about things called friend functions, and we are not going to talk about all the things that drive you insane when you learn C++ in the 90s. We are going to make it nice and easy and a Python introduction to object orientation. These are the important things you need to know. Once you have these things down, then you can go look into the nitty gritty. Then you can go look into C++ and go, whoa, virtual functions, abstract virtual functions. Oh, blah, 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 blah. And then you can go bananas that way. Right now, I just want you to concentrate on the big things, classes, uh, how we create objects and how we use objects, inheritance, polymorphism, class variables, deconstructors, and, and some basic function overriding so we understand the relationship between that superclass and that subclass. Um, one last thing I'm going to do, and I promise you it's the last thing I'm going to do in this video, is we have a pretty long list of things here. we got an animal class, we've got a cat, we've got a dog, we're, and we're using it here down on the bottom. I'm a Python programmer. I don't like this. I want to compartmentalize. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hoop it, 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 I'm going to take all that, I'm going to copy it, woo, and I'm going to blow it away. Oh, it frightens me every time. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the top here. I have my dog class, my, uh, my cat class, and my animal class. And I'm going to say this is my animal library. Okay? And I am going to save it as animallib.py. All right. So now I have a file called animallib, and it has three classes in it, animal, cat, and dog. So what am I going to do? Being a clever programmer, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to open anything. I'm going to create a brand new, new file. Look at this. And I'm going to say main program for animal stuff and I'm going to call it file save as animain okay what's animain going to have in it you guessed it all of my stuff now it doesn't have to be denoted as main anymore that's what it does there's one line I'm missing this will break a hundred ways from Sunday if I run it let's do it Hey, what the hey? What's going on? D1, Durr, dog. What's dog? There's no idea what dog is. You know why? Because I have to import my things from animal lib. Import. Now I'm doing it this way so all of that code works. I know you're going to say, but you said just import and then put the library name in front. Uh, yes, that's what you should be doing. 
I'm doing this for expediency, so all of the code we have on the screen works. All right, all right, all right. Animal, cat, hog. So from my animal library, which resides in the shame directory, I'm going to import animal, cat, and dog. Just like functions and just like constant variables, I can import classes. Okay? They're just blueprints that we make objects with, and they're so important that just like functions and just like constants, we can import them. Okay? We've defined them separately. We have them all sitting here waiting to be used. I can grab them in that fashion. I save, and when I run, what do you think's going to happen? Everything runs the way it ran before. Okay? Only now, instead of having it all in the same file, I am modular. I have taken all of my classes out, and I put them off to the side in a library. So if I ever need to use animals, if I'm writing a program that simulates a zoo, I can go in there and I can create a zebra, and I can create a tiger, and I can create uh, anything you can think of. And I can give it its own special, you know, speak method. Although, I'll be honest, I don't know what zebras say. And a whole bunch of other things. And then I can just, at the beginning of a program, inherit animal library. And I'll have all those animals that I can create and use and do things with, as I'm doing right here, okay? Ours is a little limited. I had a base class for animal. And then I had dogs and cats, which is what I'm playing with, okay? But it's the same concept, all right? You want to be able to modularize things and then use them. So I would create that animal library, and then I would put it off to the side. Better yet, I would open it up to my colleagues, and I would say, hey, I wrote an animal library. Look at this. You can look at some of the functionality. Then you would document it and create what's called an API, a programmer interface, and teach people how to use your library. Now, nah, see, we're getting more complicated, more professional here. That's what you would do in a data science context. You would say, hey, I wrote a bunch of classes. And what they do is they take an Excel spreadsheet and they do A, B, and C, blah, 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 blah. Here's how you use it, boom, boom, boom. And that's what you do. So this is part of compartmentalizing and modularizing our code so that other people can use it so it's neat and it doesn't get, you know, a thousand lines long so that you can't understand it anymore. So now this simple little program right here is doing everything we did in this series of three videos because I'm just inheriting, uh, inheriting, I'm just importing everything from my animal library and using it here, okay? All right, then that's it. Uh, it's, we're done with object orientation. This is the third of three videos. Um, go back and watch video one again. Watch video two again, then watch this one again. Of course, I'm gonna put Animal Lib and Animain up on Sakai for you to download yourself and play. Play around with it. Create an elephant class, okay? I don't know what they would say, roar? I guess make a lion class and make them say roar or something like that. Play around with these things, okay? Try to play around with different kinds of class variables. Try to make one object talk to another object. Try, try out all of these things, okay? We've got, I don't know, today's the 20th. We've got 18 days to play around with this stuff and learn all this stuff. All right, because it's actually it's cool and it's a good way to do things. And you'll find out nowadays you have to know a little bit about object orientation because all the software written out there uses it. Uh, you'll see if you if you use R or if you use other things like that or if you bring in a Python library and want to use it, everything is based on classes. So you need you need to know this. That's why this unit is here. You can't have a graduate level course on, you know, beginning programming languages without getting some object orientation nowadays because you really need to know it. You really need to see it. But if you steep in it for a while, you read your book, you read the slides, you look at all these videos and you let it steep for a couple of days, you're going to understand it and you're going to understand that it makes sense. Okay. Um, as always, if you have any questions at all, you do one of two things. One, you put the question in the forums. That's why we have the Q&A there. So not just me, not just Hans, but also all your classmates can see whatever questions and whatever problems you might have. And then the collective class can work through it and learn and, and get the problem solved. Another thing you can avail yourself of is going to the cave. From I know it's summer and the hours are limited, but from 1 in the afternoon until 6 o'clock at night, Jamie is there. 
I also know there is a whole group of regulars that hang out there. These are the most helpful kids in the world. They want to help. They want. They know what's going on with computer science, and they want to spread the word. They want to spread the love. They want to help you become a better programmer. So they'll sit with you, and they'll say, oh, you could do this. You could do that. You could do this. They will help. They're the most helpful kids I've ever known in my entire life. Um, go. Avail yourself of those resources. Get straight with this stuff. Again, and I know I'm a broken record, you can't procrastinate. Not with this unit. This unit will clobber you dead. Some people did the whole, they, ah, unit one wasn't bad. Unit two was fine. I'll look at unit three with three days to go. What happened? The anvil fell. Believe me, a lot of people had the anvil fall. And it was because now things are getting complicated. Computer programming is like mathematics in that it's a pyramid. You know, algebra builds on top of arithmetic, and that builds up the geometry, trigonometry, calculus, analysis, blah, blah, blah. It, it all builds on top of things so that every week you're not just learning that new week. You've got to use everything you've learned up until that point and the new stuff. So object orientation is no different. You can see we're, when you do methods, what are they? They're functions. When you deal with data, what is it? It's a data object. You know, what are we going to do when we use a lot of different functions? We're going to put them in loops and we're going to iterate over them. So you need to know everything, okay? Uh, you'll be fine, though. As far as announcements, two things to keep in mind. One is that your proposal for your final project is due on Sunday. I gave you two extra days for that. Hopefully you're, you're okay with that and everything's going to be cool. I want to see some good, interesting projects and ideas. Um, it doesn't have to be killer. Three pages, you know, maybe a couple graphics, a good idea. How are you going to do it? Have fun with it. Think of it as an elevator pitch. It's not a design document. Don't tell me about how much your data you're going to have and where, what it's going to be and where you got it from and blah, blah, blah. I don't give a rat's rear end about that right now. That's for the design document. I want a proposal. Think Shark Tank. Think I'm going to pitch this idea. I want to make it sound interesting. This is how data science is going to help us do better in this area. Ha. Okay. And I put some samples up on Sakai. So go look at those samples. Go look at some of what my previous classes have done as far as proposals are concerned. And you'll get the gist of what I'm looking for. Okay. Second announcement is I will be there on campus on the 25th Monday for our class. I have not gotten it yet, but I ordered an iWalk 2.0. So I have a pirate leg in route. I will be shoving my damaged non-weight bearing right Achilles repair leg in, in that crazy contraption. And hopefully I will be walking around on this pirate leg thing. So a, a very at the very least, you'll be entertained by seeing that craziness. But also I'm going to be going over the assignments for unit three for the people who got hung up on that. Reading from files, cleaning data, Harshad, Siete, output files, blah, 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 blah. We're going to do all that. We're going to live code that live and in class. So make sure you're there if you want to get up to speed with that. Other than that, keep chugging along. Keep reading resources. Keep Remember, there's nothing stopping you from going back and looking at previous videos. There's nothing stopping you from going back and reading previous slide sets. I've had a couple people come up to me and say, well, I'm having trouble... Uh, doing this and doing that. And I'm like, well, we went over that in unit two. And they went, what, what? And I'm like, go back and reread it. Go reread them. I do that all the time. Believe me, I don't get things until like the third or fourth pass. Okay? I reread things constantly. My house is full of books. I pick up books I read five years ago and I start reading them again. And I'm like, I don't remember any of this. And I just reread it. It's good to be dim. You save a lot of money that way. I can pick up a book I read five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's brand new to me. <laughs> Actually, I got a new book. It's called Off to Be the Wizard. I don't know if you've read a book called uh, Ready Player One. It's a really good book about video games. This is another good book about video game and video game characters and stuff. So it was highly recommended to me by a friend, so I got this, so I'm going to read this now. I did not finish Narconomics yet. I'm hopefully going to finish tonight and read an extra chapter in that. All right? For the most part, everybody's doing good. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep your chin up. We're only a month away. You keep working hard every night. There's light at the end of the tunnel. In 28 days, you're going to be a Python programmer with, with a master's degree, a master's degree, a master's class, oh, under your belt, and it's all going to be good. All right? So keep working hard and keep going with all this stuff. 
questions in the forums, all right? In a couple of days, I'm filming this Wednesday night, so in a couple of days, probably over the weekend, I will release the homework assignment. Promise me you won't let it freak you out. Steep in it a couple days. Think about what you would do. Google things. Talk to your friends. Don't cheat. Don't ask people for code, but talk to your friends about how would you do this? How would you solve this? How would I do this? How would you represent this? Blah, blah, blah. Do those things. I want you to do those things, all right? All right, you'll be good. I may even do another video real quick and just do it in the middle of the unit and, and you know, throw some sample stuff out there. No promises, because I don't know how busy I'm going to get once I get, you know, walking again and I get out of this godforsaken house. But we'll see what I can do, all right? All right, then you be good. I'm getting out of here, and I will talk to you very soon. All right, be good. Bye.